this is actually kind of a new topic for me based on some kind of opportunistic data that I was able to gather when I was doing my dissertation project, which was on paternal investment and child care. And Sure. Yep. Um, so um, it's it's kind of a new and interesting topic for me, and um, hopefully you guys will find some interesting things in there as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about patch choice theory, just to very briefly, and then I'm going to spend a little time talking about the field site and some background, particularly as um, the Mardu who I'm going to be speaking about have moved into sort of contemporary. Uh, outstation settlements. And then I'm going to talk about foraging in the shop, which is um, a new patch that they have. And so that's first I'm going to talk about what happens sort of within that patch. And then I'm going to talk about how the addition of the shop patch um, affects decisions about foraging in the bush. And then just a few conclusions. So a patch is basically uh, a clumping of resources um, that should be commonly identifiable to people. And uh, patch choice theory is based largely off of uh, the marginal value theorem. So the idea is that the, uh, the amount, the length of time that you stay in the patch should correlate to the profitability of that patch. So basically, as uh, profitability increases, then you should make a shift to a different patch. So that's the, sort of the main driving question, then. When should a forager leave one patch in favor of another? And there are four assumptions um, that drive patch choice theory. The first is that the resources are distributed heterogeneously. The second, that patches are encountered at random and in proportion to their frequency. Third, that a forager will not return to a depleted patch until that patch is rejuvenated. And fourth, that travel time is unproductive. Now, uh, the reality is that when uh, anthropologists have gone out to test patch choice theory, in humans at least, um, it's extremely rare to find that um, some or all of these assumptions are not violated. So that makes studying this um, kind of difficult, and this study is no exception to that. So um, I don't in any way um, try to say that we've met all these assumptions. But talking about where things vary from the assumptions, I think, is part of what's interesting about so this just shows you just a little graph to uh, the idea is you want to be at the point where the slope is at its maximum. And um, so you sort of see that would be around here. And then after that, returns start to diminish. And so you should um, leave the patch. <coughs> so what I'm interested in today is trying to think about what happens when a new patch is added to a forager economy. How does that new patch operate? And how do foraging decision, decisions change as a result of the integration of that new patch? And I had a kind of interesting <coughs> way to look at this because there's a shop at the outstation where I work. So they continue to forage, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But, um, but they have this shop out there. And this, is, I think, is fairly common in a lot of foraging societies today, that they do have some access to market economy and some sort of store-bought goods. And yet, when you look at studies of patch choice, they tend to ignore the fact that there is this other um, source of food availability. So I wanted to actually explicitly kind of look at that and see how it was affecting the growth. So I do my work in the Western Desert of Australia. And um, the Western Desert is actually a cultural area, not a geographic area. So it's this gray area. And the red dot gives you a general idea of where the field site is. You can see it's pretty country. And just to give you a little bit of background, so in the Western Desert, there was something called the Rabbit Proof Fence that was built. It was in the early 1900s. And this was, um, they started to set up supply outposts and things like that in order to build the fence. And so this was, um, for a lot of Mardu, the first opportunity for contact came um, with that Rabbit Proof Fence before cattle stations. It was before the Canning Stock Route, which runs through the same area, was built. And in 1946, there was a mission set up at Jibalon. And um, so this was meant to bring Aborigines in, to convert them to Christianity. It wound up being a, pretty much a failure on that front. Um, I think they only converted like seven people. And uh, the mission closed in 1969. But in 1965, the last groups from the bush started to come in. And that was uh, both because there was a severe drought going on at that time, and also um, 
there was missile testing going on, and so they were actually actively trying to bring the remaining groups of Aborigines in so that this, they wouldn't be affected by this missile testing, which had some mixed results. Um, and so then the mission closed, and the land was handed over to the Mardu. And um, so one of the things that was important to them was getting back out to be able to do more foraging, make sure that they maintained um, a connection to their land and to all the, be able to perform the traditional rites and things that went along with that. So in the late 1980s, they actually formed this outstation movement where groups of Mardu left, these are outstations from Jigalong, and they went out back into their um, traditional lands and formed these uh, very remote outstations with, at the time they were started, very little access to um, water, uh, food, things like that. And in 2002, just to note, they did get native title, and at the time it was the largest native title holding in all of Australia. So this is what the outstation looks like. Um, you can see there's not much else around it as far as, um, you know, the, the bush. And this is what it looks like when you're in there. So now they do have, um, they're sedentary, they have permanent housing, they have plumbing, they have TV, they have electricity, all sorts of things. Um, so uh, it has changed a lot over the 25 years or so since they were first started. And they now um, already rely on really a mixed source diet. So the estimate is that they still get about 20 to 50 percent of their foods from the bush. Um, but that's supplemented by the store-bought food. So this was our fridge on a pretty typical day, and there's a bag of camel meat there. This is a leg of a kipra, which is a, like a bustard, and the cup is full of uh, nectar. Um, what you don't see is that next to the fridge there would be a big cardboard box full of white bread, sugar, uh, biscuits, crackers, all sorts of you know, not so healthy things. And um, the, they have sort of the same kind of health problems that are going on in a lot of Aboriginal places. There's an increase in type 2 diabetes, um, obesity is on the rise, and I haven't seen any studies specifically of malnourishment or vitamin deficiencies, but for the Mardi in particular, but you can guess it's, it's probably um, increasingly becoming an issue. So I work with um, Rebecca and Doug Bird who are at Stanford, and they have done a lot of work on Mardi foraging. And so this work is meant to complement what they've done because most of their focus has been on what happens when people go out foraging. So you go out and they would do these focal follows looking at the decisions that people were making once they had decided to go out hunting. What I did was I collected data that was, um, had more breadth and less depth and was able to look at the decision of why people were going out foraging and what they were going for. So. Um, but this just gives you a brief overview of what the birds have looked at. It's mainly a lot of work on division, and, division of foraging labor, because women hunt in this community, and, uh, and then also looking at fire ecology and how the use of fire in hunting uh, affects different resources, both small game and now they're also looking at the effects on large game. As far as access to the market economy goes, there really is no regular access to paid work. There are some mines in the area, and Mardu will occasionally go out there and work for short periods of time, get training, things like that, but there, I really can't think of anybody who's worked out there for more than maybe six weeks at a time. So it's, it's essentially, and not even that is rare, so um, no real regular access to paid work. Um, there is an art movement that's starting up, so people will get some sporadic income if they do a bunch of paintings and maybe win an award or sell them. Um, but that's really at the early stages as well. Um, so most people's income is government support. Almost everybody who's 16 or over gets one of these three forms of payments. Pension payments go to, um, to elders. Parenting payments are, if um, obviously, if you have children, and then it's uh, ratcheted up depending on how many children you have. And CDEP is the community deployment. A community Development Employment Program, uh, which is supposed to be sort of a welfare for work program. The reality is it's mostly welfare and not so much work, um, but that's the idea. Um, and some non-market influences to be aware of are just there's a lot of gambling that goes on, so you'll see this especially around payday happening, that people will go out, they'll pay, pay for you know, $500,000, people will come home winning, so it's, it's a significant amount of money. And um, which I think in itself is sort of a form of um, of sharing, of, of redistribu redistribution of wealth. And then there's um, 
this general interest reciprocity, which is still really important as far as food sharing goes, but also sharing money, cigarettes, anything else you can imagine. This is what the shop looks like. It's got, you can see it's pretty small. It's got basic goods in it, flour, rice, pasta, canned vegetables, things like that. Um, frozen meats, a lot of junk food. Um, the nearest actual grocery store, if you wanted to get to it, is about 400 kilometers on dirt roads, so it's not something that you would just say, I'm going to go to the grocery store. It's, you know, you have to plan a trip to town and the fuel and everything. It's obviously be expensive for that. Um, it's open only between one and four hours a day, so it's a pretty, you know, social gathering place. Everybody shows up, buys their stuff at the shop, and deliveries come once every fortnight. Um, that's the ideal. However, in the summertime, which is um, when a lot of the data that I have was collected, um, the roads can get washed out, and then obviously bringing an 18-wheeler in on those roads is, you know, it's treacherous at the best of times and impossible um, for uh, several months of the year. And the other thing is that the administrators change frequently. They have these um, white Australian coordinators who are, take charge of doing all of these shop loadings and things like that. And if they uh, are in flux, then store loadings are one of the things that suffers. So this is just gives you a basic idea of what you find in the shop. The cuts of meat are pretty poor, um, but they are there. And then you can see just a wide room arrangement of foods that are full of fat and sugar and salt. This is what it looks like on loading day. So it's the whole community um, is uh, participates. This, everybody knows when the truck arrives, it's hard to miss it. And everybody gets out to help unload. And I think this has you know, a couple of different benefits. First of all, everybody gets free Cokes if they help. Um, but also, you get to know what came in on the truck. So people are sort of, you know, figuring out in their mind what they want to come in and buy when the shop opens. And uh, so it's actually kind of a fun event. So how do we think about the shop as a patch? Um, the first thing that I wanted to look at was what um, affects people's ability to be able to extract food from the patch? What would cause patch depletion? So one idea is that it could be food availability. So we talked about the loadings and how there are things affecting that. Um, and the second would be monetary availability. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. But basically, people don't have enough money. They can't buy the food in the shop, even if it's there. So I wanted to see which of these factors seems to be most predictive of how much money people spend on store-bought foods. So first of all, thinking about <coughs> food scarcity. Um, so there are these infrequent shop loadings. And that can, you know, the shop looks so beautiful and full in that previous picture of the shops. Uh, the store is full. But, <coughs> The, uh, the shelves here are probably more representative of what happens a lot of the time. You have some, you know, some maple syrup and some uh, taco shells that nobody would ever eat and not too much else. So, um, and the other thing that happens is there's really sort of unequal distribution. So the first, sorry, unequal depletion. So the first thing that tends to go out are fruits and vegetables. Either they get bought up really quickly, particularly if tourists come in, because tourists will come in and they'll buy an entire box of apples and there's no way to regulate who's buying what, which is really unfortunate. And then, of course, fruits and vegetables are going to go bad first. Um, the other thing that happens, particularly in the summer, is the freezers will malfunction and you'll end up losing a lot of frozen foods that way. Um, and the only thing that happens between loadings is that um, if one of these administrators goes into town, he will buy cases of soda and cases of uh, you know, cartons of cigarettes and bring those back. So those things tend to be, um, uh, they, they'll, uh, they're replenished more than, than other things, unfortunately. And the second idea here is economic scarcity. Um, so I'm just going to read this quote from a, a kind of qualitative paper on, on food and nutrition in these communities. Is one of the most important factors in food choice is access to resources such as cash. The two-week income cycle often determines when and how much food can be purchased. Income is used for immediate consumption, not for saving. As a result, residents often live on a cycle of feast or famine. So this is what's talked about a lot when people talk about um, nutrition and Aboriginal communities, is this cycle of feast or, feast or famine that really is driving people's ability to, um, to purchase food, and particularly to purchase healthy food. So that um, was sort of an obvious um, prediction for me to look at in this community. So my data for this part, I wound up being able to get the shop register receipt rolls um, for about 61 days between January and April. 
I wasn't able to get all of them because the, there were six coordinators over the six month period I was collecting data from January to June and some of them were nice and gave me the roles and others of them said no way you can't have them. So, um, so I got the ones that you know, would have been otherwise thrown in the trash. Um, and from that I was able to get the total gross for each day and then um, cat uh, totals for each different category of type of and then, Pay dates I was able to get just from a pay, uh, you know, luckily everybody gets paid on the same day every two weeks, so that makes this really nice and easy. Um, and again, pretty much every adult in the community is getting paid on that day, so it's a really um, easy thing to look at that cycle of, of feast or famine if it exists. And then um, I had the shop loading dates also. So this is the two variables that I created here. So days since payday, that's going to look at economic uh, scarcity and days of loading is going to look at food scarcity. And you can see here that for both the daily gross and the daily gross divided by the number of households resident in the community on that day, so I had um, information on how, uh, whether anybody, anybody was living in that household, because people are pretty mobile moving in and out, so I was able to adjust, not at a complete census level, but pretty close. And you can see in both cases that um, the time from loading winds up being really significant, and the, the payday cycle that I expected to be um, more important actually isn't significant at all. <coughs> and here's patch depletion. So I then put them into um, the same model, and you see the same effect come out here. So it turns out that food scarcity seems to have a really significant effect on purchasing <coughs> patterns. And economic or monetary scarcity um, doesn't really seem to have any effect at all. <coughs> I look at food uh, scarcity effects by type. So I did this also for the day since payday, but nothing came out, so it wasn't worth really looking at. But um, here, what you can see is so I had um, groceries, water, cool drinks, which are soda, meat, and then cigarettes and tobacco. And, um, <coughs> So you can see a pretty clear trend, particularly for, for groceries and meat and water. Um, cigarettes and cool drinks are um, a little bit odd. Um, cool drinks didn't come out to be significant. Cigarettes did, but this, I'm sure this, this outlier here is from the coordinator bringing in some cartons of cigarettes and it's going to up the sales for that day on sort of a weird day. Uh, and probably it's right around the same time here, so probably that's what's going on with all of these. But as far as real food, groceries, and meat go, um, you can see it's a pretty obvious trend. Um, I wasn't able to look at fruit and vegetables, unfortunately, um, because as I was going through the register rolls, fresh fruit and vegetables are sold um, quite cheap. They're maybe, you know, sort of 50 cents for each thing for a squash. For, but um, people, there's a fruit and vegetable button on the register. People um, would use it sometimes only for the fresh vegetables, and sometimes they would also include the canned vegetables in there. So it, that's going to change the totals um, to, to, to an extent that it wouldn't have made sense on the graph. So. Can I ask a question? Sure. So is this because there's no more food in the shop to buy? Is mm -hmm. that what I should? Yeah, this? yeah. So you get, I mean, when you go in there and the days before a loading, it's, there's hardly anything there. Um, so, yeah. However, this was kind of interesting. So this is looking at the percent totals. Um, so there's no change in the, in the, and none of these came out to be significant. So there was no change in the, the relative amount of each category that people were buying. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So you would have basically the same composition to your groceries on you know, 20 days out from loading as you would the day after the loading. Um, and that was sort of striking to me because I expected that people would be buying you know, more cool drinks clo you know, when that was you know, all there was left in the shop or something. So um, I wish I had some more, you know, a different level of data to be able to look at that more. But I, I imagine that if there are any vegetables or, or um, meat or anything left, people are going to make an effort to keep trying to buy that until it runs out. And, um, or it could, but the alternative, of course, is that everything is becoming depleted the same way. I'm guessing that's not the case, but I don't really, I don't have, have uh, data on, on what was in the shop on any particular day, so I can't really look at that. But. 
that another possibility is that if there's one thing that, or two things that are driving their visit to the shop, and they have a schema that says when you go to the shop, you always buy other stuff, drinks or cigarettes or whatever, then you're going to get, you're going to get, it as the principal thing is completed, so are all the secondary things mm -hmm. too. Yeah. And I think people also just don't bother going to the shop as much as things are, are getting depleted. So, I mean, I guess that wouldn't affect the relative totals except that, you know. But um, <coughs> I don't think they're, they don't, and there are some things that, that will never sell, like the taco shells. Like, it kind of doesn't matter how hungry people are. They don't buy things like that. So it's sort of strange that they're doing that. So the next thing that I wanted to look at was, okay, so now we sort of know that it seems to be this food scarcity issue that's really driving things much more than the cycle, the payday cycle, as far as people's access to food in the shop. That seems to be the patch depletion. It actually makes it wind up looking much more like a patch um, that you would consider with foraging, that the, the actual resource within the patch is getting depleted as opposed to the money issue, which would have made things a little bit more complicated. So it worked out um, that way. But I then wanted to find out, okay, well, how does depletion of this shop patch affect hunting patterns? Um, and at what point do Marty shift their foraging patterns to reflect the, pe the depletion of the patch? So to do this, I had the same, the pay dates and the shop loading dates. I continued to look at least um, for the beginning at both of these because I thought, well, maybe the effect, the trend won't, won't stick with the loading being important. So I did look at both. Um, and then I used this data from a hunting log that I had that ran from January to June 2006 and it covered 94 days within that period. And what I did was for every household <coughs> in the community, I was able to find out um, whether anybody in that household went out hunting, um, who was in the party, what they went for, if they got anything, um, and who they shared it with. So, um, and then because I would know, um, so I was able also to get a household level census for each of those days also, because I would know that, you know, so-and-so's whole household has gone to town and whatever, so. So I'm just going to talk about the four main types of hunting briefly um, that I looked at in the analysis here. So Gowana hunting is performed by both men and women. It's really traditional technology, so you have this kind of digging stick and you're looking for an entrance hole and then you hook around and eventually figure out where the guana is buried underneath and you dig for it. Um, and they use this controlled burning um, to sort of clear the land and it's easier to see where the burrows are and things like that. And the burning seems to improve both immediate and short-term hunting returns. Um, people tend to hunt individually or in pairs and sharing goes, they then come back to this dinner time <coughs> camp where everybody um, will share. So of the people who went out hunting, things get shared out um, between cooperative partners, and then if somebody didn't went out and didn't get anything, they would be shared with also. So it's sharing that occurs out in the field. <coughs> then there's kangaroo hunting, and there are two types of kangaroo which are pretty different. Um, the first is um, called a giddy giddy, and that's a smaller body kangaroo. It lives in these rocky sand hill um, areas and you have to basically be out on foot tracking it and chasing it. You would very rarely actually see one from a vehicle that you would be able to shoot. Um, so it, this, this is a lot of work and then of course you have to carry it back with you after you get it. But they'll track them sometimes for days. Um, and then the marlou is a larger body size. They don't tend to be right around the outstation, but if people are coming in out of, out of town, they'll often see them and opportunistically shoot them. Um, sometimes they'll go out specifically for them because um, they're in the plains and you actually can just um, usually shoot them with the, with the rifle from the car. Um, and, but for both of them, there are traditional rules about the processing and the sharing of the meat. So um, this is still an important food source um, culturally as well as, um, as for subsistence. Keepera is this buster. You can see it's a pretty big bird. Um, and this tends to be sort of small party vehicle hunts that go out. Um, they are opportunistically hunted a lot. So if you're going out to a meeting or a funeral, you see them flying, you'll shoot them. Um, or on return from other hunts sometimes. So if you're going out for a camel and you're coming home and you see a keeper, then you would shoot it. But uh, people will also go out quite frequently just for a keeper. Um, again, the processing and, and sometimes the consumption occurs out in the field at the dinner time camps. That was true for the kangaroo as well, so all three. Um, 
and there tends to be gender specific processing so um, women tend to be the ones who are supposed to um, do most of the processing as opposed to the kangaroo where the men are supposed to do it um, but women can shoot too they don't tend to do it that frequently but they can so there aren't any whereas kangaroo hunting tends to really be pretty um, pretty much in the male domain only and finally, camel hunting. So this is a pretty new hunt type because, um, well, first of all, camels were only introduced in the 1860s, um, but also you need a pretty significant amount of technology to be able to hunt these camels. So you not only need uh, a vehicle and a rifle, but you need either a pickup truck or a trailer or something to be able to get all the meat back, and then you need um, axes, knives, things like that to be able to, to process it. Um, these hunting parties tend to consist mainly of young men, um, the processing takes about one to two hours. They're pretty easy to find. So as opposed to the kangaroo has a really long search time and um, the processing time is shorter. For the camels, um, the search time is not very long, but the processing time is, is sort of the main burden. And uh, so they do this primary processing out in the field where they basically you know, gut it, take the legs and the ribs, throw those in the truck, and then they would give you know, a leg to one household, a leg to another household, and then there's secondary processing that goes on in the house. Um, and as opposed to the other three hunt types, there's actually pretty little cultural significance attached to camel hunting. So there aren't any prescribed rules about things. Um, it tends to be young men who do it, but that's not because it has to be or anything like that. So this is um, a graph to show you a little bit about the return rates. Now. It's, a, it's a funky graph because I couldn't actually get um, the amount of calories that you can get from a camel onto it without squishing everything else down, so um, you just have to pretend that this is scaled way up. But um, it's pretty similar to if you are if you look at a graph like for the Ache or something, you've got sort of nectar and honey is having really high return re return rates um, you know, for a little time. And then this is the keeper out of the bus herd here, kangaroo, and guana, which is, you know, um, obviously you get fewer calories. The guana are only going to be like this big, so you have to get quite a few of them. And camel is just completely off the charts. Now, if we were to add the shock to this, um, that also would be, you know, way off the, sh the charts in terms of number of calories. Probably not as high as a camel on your typical grocery load, but um, but obviously the time is going to be a lot shorter. So the first thing I did was I looked at some kind of general predictors of. Um, of scarcity. So I looked at the number of households who were out hunting, the number of hunting parties, so this is the number of households who had a member that went out hunting that day. Hunting parties is the number of parties that went out that day. Um, people hunting is the raw number of people who went out, adults only. And then the large game hunts are the, the number of large game hunts that happened. And um, what we see here is nothing particularly interesting um, except that um, large game hunts actually seems to have um, a small effect on um, days since payday and then you see it again it's you know approaching significance here which just basically means it's probably worth looking into a little bit more so um, so what's happening here is then I put them into some Poisson regressions just to see what's happening and basically the effect fell out especially um, people hunt you could see was almost significant here, but actually um, it didn't meet the assumption for a Poisson that uh, the variance was equal to mean, so I had to put it into a negative binomial and do that, it falls out completely. So basically we see no pattern at all <laughs> as far as um, hunting patterns and either um, days load or days since payday. So the next thing that I wanted to do was I said, okay, well, I'm still kind of curious about this large game effect that almost happened. Maybe we're obscuring things by throwing all these different prey types together. So I wanted to break it out. So I looked then at um, these four main hunt types and um, whether they had any effect on either the food scarcity or the economic scarcity. And what you see is the only thing that comes up is, um, is camel um, with, with an effect. Um, on days loading. So when you've got little food in the shop, people go out hunting for camel much more frequently. And I'll just show you that. So these were sort of the general results. So over this 94-day hunting log, people went out for keeper 42 times, um, and 
this is just tells you a little bit about the sharing. So um, on average, they were shared with um, one and a little bit households, range from one to three. Kangaroo, people went out for only eight times, um, and they're shared a little bit more widely. And camel, six times. So the numbers aren't huge here, but um, you get a lot of meat from the camel the last for quite a while. Sharing means other than the hunter's household? No, it includes the hunter's household. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so you can see the keeper basically, what that means is that the keeper are basically kept within the household. So, and the only time that, uh, so if people got four keeper, which would happen sometimes, you know, you might get a, get a few of them, then you would tend to keep one in your household and maybe you would give the other ones away. But it's, it's really not that much, it's enough meat to feed a family. You know, it's sort of, I mean, it's a Thanksgiving turkey or something, let's say, even a little bit bigger. So you'd have enough for leftovers and things, but it's not going outside the household. Um, whereas kangaroo, because that's not that much meat on these giddy-giddies either, but because there's some prescriptive sharing norms, uh, they tend to get shared outside the household a little bit more frequently. And then um, camel are almost always shared pretty widely. And this just is a log plot of that same return rate um, so that you could see camel on the same scale here. Um, but what you can tell from this is that, so if you were thinking about optimal foraging theory, this kind of makes sense. So you should be, if you were gonna leave the shop patch and go for something else, this is clearly what you should go for, right? Because you don't have to be out for, you know, it's, it's less time than a kangaroo and it's, you know, just marginally more than keeper or iguana, and yet you get just a massive amount more meat. So it's, yeah. I noticed you haven't said anything about fuel costs. So how would this affect your choice of patch, your, your choice of uh, particular prey? I don't think that it's going to make too much of a difference. I didn't have, so there were some fuel, um, uh, there, some fuel charges in the receipt rolls, but they weren't, sometimes people would pay for it at the shop and sometimes they'd pay it direct, so I couldn't actually assess like how much money people were paying for fuel. People talk about it. Um, in general, but not specific to any one prey choice. So I think that it might make a difference about whether you go out hunting or not, but not which you go out for. Because both cam camel and keeper, you sort of, you're out in, you know, a pretty, maybe you go out for an hour driving around slowly on these back roads for both of them. Kangaroo, you wouldn't be driving around as much, but you would go out to a spot, sometimes further out, and then you would get out and hunt on foot from there. Same with Kalana. So there's not gonna be, I suspect, just from having done it a bunch of times, that much variation in the fuel charges between prey types. But it would be interesting to, to actually get some data on it and see if that's true. But again, it is probably, if you have no, if, if payday was coming up as being really important in terms of um, patch, you know, people's access to food in the shop, then I would, I, that would make me um, a little bit more concerned about not thinking about fuel more. Because if people don't have money to buy food, they probably don't have money to buy fuel either. Um, so. But that doesn't seem to be the big predictor here. So, so again, this basically comes up as being pretty much exactly what you would expect from a bachelor choice theory, that this is going to be the thing that you would go for more. So a kind of natural question, and one that Rebecca and Doug and I have all been thinking about, even you know before this analysis, is why wouldn't you go and hunt camels all the time? I mean, we all know that it's pretty easy to go out. You see them everywhere. People pass them over all the time. So in all of the, the focal follow data that Doug and Rebecca have, almost every time you go out, you see camels. People point to them, oh, look at the camels. They have a gun, they have bullets, um, and they don't get it. So it's, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, it's, it's not something, this kind of question of, well, here's the optimal thing to do, why, are, why aren't people doing it? Um, actually, you know, that result sort of fits pretty nicely in with the rest of these patch choice studies. Um, so just to give you a brief, some brief examples. So um, Eric Smith found that among the Inuit, that although people spent more time in the, in the more profitable patch, they didn't choose that patch exclusively. So the same thing, people are, wouldn't be going out for camels all the time. And with the Bari, that um, people both hunt and fish, and although fishing has a higher return rate, people tend to hunt much more than they fish. Also doesn't make 
um, too much in, this, in terms of a strict patch choice kind of model. And there's two sort of explanations for this. One is more of a risk reduction kind of strategy. So you might actually be making these choices based on some daily variation. And Rich Sosis actually looked at if luck fish, fishers and found that that actually was true, that they did seem to be responding. So if there's bad weather or something like that, you might actually be, um, if you have just sort of a general return rate for each, um, each type of patch, that might not be um, a detailed enough source of information. People might be going on, on um, more of a daily variability. And the other idea is that um, people are going to go for, you know, a wider range of macro macronutrients. So if you want for the same prey type all the time, maybe you know you should be gathering part of the time or getting some of these other food sources. But I would add um, a third explanation here, which I think is really important, which is there are a lot of social benefits to hunting. And this is sweet <coughs> sweet and all the other uh, literature that's come out. Um, and those social benefits may in fact outweigh the energetic ones. Um, so people talked about this when they sort of theorized about the past choice model that you know it's got a great heuristic value, but its ability to you know to mimic reality is sort of similar to other models in that you know you have these assumptions that aren't met. And um, Kelly in his book on foraging theory talked about the fact that these models of optimal foraging theory actually are important because they flag the resources that um, are used despite the fact that they um, they they don't fit the model in terms of an energetic uh, cost. So here I think we really see evidence of that. And if you think about the, um, the different prey types that I talked about, the first three, goanna, kipra, and kangaroo, all have these really high social values attached to them. And I think that, whereas camel don't. And I think that that, that means that the reason that the, the, the um, the reasons why people are deciding to go for those other three may not have very much to do with food and calories. It probably has something to do with it, but it's not going to be exclusively um, driving those decisions. Whereas with camel, because there isn't that social importance to going out and getting a camel, um, you know, the only reason people would go out and get it is to is is to feed a bunch of households, and so it makes it makes sense that that would be the one. So um, patch choice theory does seem to apply in the modern foraging context. And um, I've shown here that even when you add a foreign food source um, to the model, that you could still <coughs> use the theory effectively. Um, so, and we saw a pretty clear uh, correlation here between cam camel hunting and depletion of the shop patch. So I think it's important to think about it um, in all of these different contexts. And um, I, I'm always a little bit wary when I read about these um, models of foraging that particularly that are you know not sort of focal follow data but that are that are completely ignoring the fact that there's this other source of food there and I think it's um, I don't think it has to be a disaster if you include it in the model I guess is, is part of the lesson learned here um, and if it is that's probably something to be done with as well um, and so we have this clear relationship with camels, but um, these other hunt types, which have social benefits attached to them, don't tend to fall out of the model. And the other thing that's interesting here is that when you add a semi-reliable food source like shop-bought foods, and I'm saying they're semi-reliable, obviously, because we know that there's patch depletion, right? Um, that that can actually promote continuation of foraging activities with social value. So I think the general idea is that you bring in market integration and you bring something like a shop into these communities, and that's going to mean that people are going to stop foraging. That's the, you know sort of the the general line that you hear from people that this is going to be bad in terms of maintaining these these traditions. But in fact. Um, what I think this is showing is that people are definitely going out and they're hunting for these things that you know they shouldn't when they, you know, I mean, you could also think of a camel as the other new patch here, right? So even if you've got the shock patch added and the camel patch added, um, people are still going out and getting these other things. And I think that really highlights the fact that hunting is not really just about the, the caloric value that you get from these things, but there's a really important social value. And that that actually may be fostered by the fact that people know they can go out and get food if they need to. And um, so if they want to spend the day out camping really hunting, they can. And a couple of practical implications. So outstation communities 
Um, I think we have to think about them a little bit differently than other Aboriginal com communities that have more infrastructure or closer to town. So most of the literature um, on Aboriginal nutrition tends to focus on these communities that have not only a little shop, but they also usually have a takeaway store and they are close enough to a paved road that they can get into a real grocery store. And thinking about you know, and that's where that kind of feast or famine cycle thing comes in. And I think that, I'm sure that that probably is really important in those kind of communities, but I think that we need to think about the type of community when you're thinking about um, what's affecting health and nutrition, because there's there's obviously a different situation going on in these very remote communities and, um, where you have food scarcity being so important and economic scarcity actually not seeming to matter very much at all. Uh, and finally, um, groups that maintain their cultural tradition, traditions may reap actually some positive nutritional benefits. So we have an assortment of bush foods that remain in the diet. So even though the, there's some that should fall out according to um, an optimal foraging model, they stay in. And that means that people are eating more bush foods um, than they are in some of these other communities. And the other thing to think about is that there's a sharing ethic that goes along with having a large degree of foraging. You see pretty much you know, cross-culturally. And I think this may actually be re reducing the risk to monetary scarcity that um, you see in other areas. So if, um, if you have all of this kind of tradition in place where people are going out foraging a lot, it's promoting a general norm of sharing. And I think that that might, I, you know, I don't have any evidence in this, but my feeling is that that's going to mean that people, if that norm is in place, that it's going to it's going to affect um, you know how people are sharing uh, their foods in the shop. So you might see that this feast famine cycle is actually not that important because people are sharing them. And you see with the gambling a lot too, like in a way that's sort of spreading the money around in the community so that people will have access to it. And by doing that, I think you know we've got these norms that then are able to um, sort of make sure that there isn't there isn't this cycle that's so damaging. And I think, you know, this kind of hoarding your money kind of thing might happen more when you get away from that norm and into sort of, you know, an every man for himself kind of um, ethic of subsistence. to Rebecca about this, I said, I'm actually surprised that Keepra didn't come up sort of closer to camel in, in being predictive. Um, because it seems less traditional to me than the, than the kangaroo or the guana. But, um, but she said, oh no, there's a lot of these same um, rules about sharing and, and who process it, processes things are, um, are actually still in place for the Keepra too. So, um, but yeah, camel is sort of a funny but it's, it tastes pretty good, especially if you make like a stew of that, stew of it or something like that, cook it down. Do you have any people who, for example, choose to do more camel hunting than they want to do traditional stuff? How does the community, if you have those people, how does the community do that? Camel hunting is pretty much in the domain of these young men. So what I saw happening was that the, the older men didn't tend to go out for them, but they would say to their grandsons, go out and get a camel. So. Um, and because I was limited in the amount of, I, I'm guessing the camel effect is even actually, I mean, I'm pretty sure of this result because they, the loading days was only over a three month period, but I was able to look at the hunting log for six months and it's pretty common. So you would see these grandfathers when people were, you know, low on food saying, go out and get a camel. And, and the only people who have rifles um, are the elder men. Um, and so uh, they would, you know, lend their rifle out to their grandsons and tell them, you know, go out and get, go out and get a camel. Um, I would say 
the Kipra is interesting in that way too because you don't see a lot of people going out and doing this kind of traditional kangaroo hunting. It's much harder to do. But and the Kipra hunting is much easier. You can go out as a family for an hour or two in the evening with you know, as long as you have a car and a rifle, you just go out and shoot. And that's that's why I think I was predicting that this that maybe was gonna show up differently. Um, and I as far as how people are viewed because of that, I mean, I think it does seem to fall that the people who were doing more keeper hunting, less kangaroo hunting, were the people who were sort of less traditional, more market integrated. But I don't, you know, there wasn't a huge stigma about I, I that. I guess because I asked because we do a lot of camel hunting, we sort of build up a lot in the market. Social capital. It's one of the things that I thought about whether, you know, whether there's sort of a signaling benefit to going out and getting this large show game. But I... Um, well, even without the signal value, I mean, it's just giving away the meat to incur some obligation to that. Yeah. I don't think it does, because I think um, the generational issue comes into play. So um, I don't think that these grandfathers really ever feel obligated to pay their grandsons by giving them some meat the next time, or it didn't seem to play out that way. I think it's a way for the young boys to sort of show off. Maybe not, it may not be, you know, meet the requirements of a signaling model, but I think there's some showing off of coming, you come home with this camel and everybody knows and it goes out to, you know, a bunch of different households. So it's showy, um, but I don't think that there's, I mean, we can look at the reciprocity of it, but I don't think it's going to be um, as, as important. Uh, my question is similar to part of well. um, So the sh social benefits of, of hunting is, is something that comes up frequently in hunter-gatherer literature. How, how do you go on and collect data? Is, that, uh, is there like some people who have developed methods to quantify these social benefits? And, and what do we know about the, the, the shape of this function? For example, is it something that is linear? So the more kangaroos you kill, the more benefits you have. Do you reach an asymptote? So you know that you get some social, you know, you're a successful hunter, and there, but then there's a point where you don't need to go out and hunt very frequently to, to maintain the status. Um, what do we know about this? Well, first, in terms of the social benefits, um, I think for Mardu, a lot of it is that going out hunting is, a, is part of taking care of country. So it, it's linked really tightly to land management and things like that. So that's kind of, it, it's less of an individual social benefit and more of a group social benefit. Um, but it also allowed, but on an individual level, you also go out and you, you burn at the same time. And it's sort of marking your territory in a way too, and making sure that everybody knows that, you know, if this is your country, you're going out and using it. It's not just, you know, so I think in that way it's tied in. As far as measuring, the benefits of it, or measuring the level of those social benefits. I don't get the impression that it's necessarily a, necessarily a quantity thing. Um, but honestly, I think that's going to be a really hard thing to detect with Mardu because the only people really going out kangaroo hunting now are elders, and it's the same thing with goanna hunting. And um, that obviously was not the case in pre-contact. And so I think trying to understand how provisioning works um, is going to be hard to actually quantify at this point. You know, we hear people talk about it. But one thing that's interesting is that the, the definition of a good hunter, what they talk about when they use this word for good hunter, is basically generosity. So um, it's a lot about sort of, you know, and Nola, who was the, the woman who lived in that, the house with me, would talk about her father a lot, and he would go out, and he would, you know, he would always sort of come back with something, but it wasn't necessarily large game. And it, this idea of being a good hunter didn't necessarily always have to be so tightly linked to large game, as much as sort of, you know, he would always come back and have something for the family and for the larger group. And there, but there's also this sort of sharing ethic that I think is tied to, um, to being a good hunter, too. So I don't if that was the case, then that was the social Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's, I mean, you can see the camels are shared a lot more widely, right? Well, I mean, there's, whether they're shared more ri widely relative to the amount of meat they get, I don't know. You'd have to, you know, I, maybe not. Um, but, uh, 
But yeah, you would, I mean, it could be that this sharing ethic is sort of getting watered down too. I mean, I think it's still, I think it's there on a general level, but how it pertains to a particular hunt, I think I'm not so sure about. We so, you know, in this database, you know, only six times did somebody go out for a camel, as opposed to 42 times that they went out for a keeper out, which again, tends to stay in the household. So that tells you something about um, people's sort of um, foraging goals, at least in this data set, that they are, they do seem to be going for, you know, household level consumption. Does it require more people to go out and get a camel? Versus other, right? so it could just be, you need a bunch of people that are going to go it, it requires more people, but it doesn't seem to take more people in reality. So the size of a keeper up party tends to be about the same size as a camel party. But, um, and so with keeper, it's like, you're, you know, if there are four or five people in the car, everybody's sort of looking, but there's not much more they have to do than that, you know. There's only one guy with the gun, and then he can go out and pick it up and put it in the car. There's you know, maybe one, maybe a different person may process it, but it wouldn't have to be that way. Whereas with camel, yeah, you need to have. I, I mean, people have done it with two guys, um, camel hunting, but it's a lot of work if it's just two men just trying to eat them. Do they? Is it the same time schedule? Do they eat them for the, the next meal that's coming up, or is it like the camel to second day? Um, for camel, you would usually. It just lasts a lot longer, so you you cook up the first portion of it usually right when you got it. But then you know, and then of course people have freezers and everything too, so you can you know we had that one bag of camel meat in the fridge, but there were four more bags of it in the freezer. So we had you know one camel goes a long way if you, depending on how many people are in your household. So who are they sharing the camel with exactly? I mean, so is it just the other people in the camel hunting party or? It, that tends to be, so because it's these young, so there's these kind of bachelor camps where all the young men will live together in one household. So often the camel party will be, you know, three guys from that camp. So they might keep a leg for themselves, and then the other legs, like if, if they got the rifle from somebody, they'll have to go and give, you know, a leg to them. But it tends to be, um, for the most part, camp-based. Um, so you've got a in different households, and you tend to spread them around. And it tends to also... It seems to be that there are these patriarchs, and those are more likely to get shared to um, than somebody else, like whether it's the patriarch or something. But, um, but that's more of a quality of studies that I have. I haven't done I thought about doing some social network analysis on the sharing, but I don't think the sample is good enough right now to be able to do that. You, your data is showing that uh, the amount of food they get in the store decreases through time after the load. So presumably there's something that's Compensating for it, they're increasing something else, but it's not hunting. You indicate that hunting doesn't really, except to some extent with the cattle, hunting really doesn't seem to be you know, increasing in inverse proportion to the decrease. Uh, so, what is what is replacing the missing food that they're not getting from the store? Well, okay, two sort of responses to that. So, first, I mean, if you, you don't have to go out and get that many camels to feed a pretty large amount of people for a while. So, I think the camel hunting is, is a pretty significant part of it. Um, but the other thing is that people go without. Um, so, I mean, it's a real thing to hear people talking about how they don't have any food. And I mean, they'll, they'll still be buying something, but like, you know, you'll see them go and buy like a meat pie and a Coke or something like that as opposed to buying you know, enough groceries to go around. So there is a lack of compensation to some degree that's happening. I just wanted to ask about the differential valuation of foods. Um, are bush foods valued more highly? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say if you ask, well, how does the camel fit into that? I guess. Um, I didn't. I didn't see people biasing for or against the camel, which I, I kind of wondered if they would. But and this is you know just just in general, sort of asking people sort of one of those questions. You know, which foods do you like? And they. Um, the young people will tend to give you a mix of, I like, you know, whatever these bush foods, and then they'll also say, you know, chicken from the shop or chops or something like that. Um, the elder people, I think, place a, more of an emphasis on bush foods. That they really, um, and people will talk about the health, that they really feel like those, the food you get from the bush is much healthier, which, in fact, it is. It's a lot leaner, you know, it actually, people have, have done studies or showed if you revert to a bush diet, it really can lower your blood pressure and all sorts of things that really quickly. Um, so it's but the younger people aren't making those differentiations? 
I think they see the social value of hunting, but as far as, if you just ask them straight up what kind of meat do you like, then yeah, they Yeah, I'm actually them. asking something else, because, I mean, in, for example, in the community where I've spent some time, um, there, there's a lot of discourse about the positive valuation of wild foods. Mm -hmm. Even though people are eating all sorts of other things, and I talk about liking it, but in terms of, you know, the talking about the as, as the health giving benefits of these is, is something that's, I mean, it's often a political statement as well yeah. to distance yourself from. Yeah, I definitely think there's that. If you ask them about it, yeah, on that level, I think people talk a lot about the value of, of bush foods. Um, it doesn't always, you know, the problem is that it doesn't always play into their actual decision making that much, or else like, they would be hunting more. And, and, and learning some of these other, I mean, guana is a really great food. And it's reliable. You can't get a ton of it, but if everybody went out and they knew how to do it, you could you could you know get as much protein as you needed probably from these guana most of the time. And people are not learning it. So um, yeah, there's big talk about about the health benefits of it, but um, unfortunately, I don't think it's translating as well as it should be. So when we saw the curves of the uh, the days since loading. In decline, but, but that's a that's a purchasing decline, right? It's not a, so. Are they at the beginning? Are they buying food that they will then eat for the for a couple of weeks? Are they buying staples, flour, and stuff like that? It doesn't work that well because you have this sharing norm. So right. if people people will definitely make larger purchases in the days after the loading, um, but but food gets depleted really quickly. Um, just as money gets depleted really quickly. So, I mean, with money, you've got these things. That, and, and so, I mean, there's sharing norms in both ways. There's a gambling that kind of redistributes things around and, and just asking people for money. But you can do that with food, too. So, but it doesn't, people don't, um, I mean, I've read in other communities that people have actually started putting padlocks on their freezers and things like that to prevent people from coming in and just taking their food. Cause we, so when I was there, you know, I would buy this food in town and I would have to keep it, like, in my room like locked in boxes under the bed because I try to, if you try to put it in the main kitchen it's gone in like you know half a day or something like that so um, yeah it's not they're not planning ahead in terms of like here's my week's worth of groceries so people go almost everybody goes to the shop every day um, and buys something but the amount that they're you know and the days after the loading it's like oh there's all these wonderful things to buy we'll buy them so people eat really well um, how did they sustain themselves before the uh, government subsidies and the shop? Uh, when they were when the outstate when they first moved out to these outstations, they were basically hunting and gathering, and then they, you know they would occasionally, if they had access to a vehicle, they would go into town or to Jigalong. There's a big store in Jigalong, they, you know, but it but enough to be able to go and get supplies. So they would go and pick up, and then they were eating. You know, they would make damper with this flour and things like that, and so they would have some of those basic staples. Certain things fell out of the optimal foraging diet a while ago, one of them being that they would grind these seeds to make, um, acacia seeds to make flour with, and that's like a really high cost activity, and you know, when you can get flour, it just doesn't make any sense. So they would have basic staples like that, and then they were hunting a lot. Um, and so it was like the late 80s, and I think the shop, I think the shop came in maybe like five years later, they started to get some things, and it's kind of increased over time. Um, you know, how much of, how much food is in the shop. It's still not very much, but it's, but yeah, much more foraging. And the only people who were living out there were people who had decided they basically wanted to go back to, to foraging. Um, so it was, you know, whereas now it's the children and grandchildren of those people, and so you see things starting to shift. I was, I was thinking about the, um, the sharing um, issue, and, and um, one thing that I noticed with, uh, with the Schwar where I work is that it does seem like when money comes in, people get more selfish about it. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, there's still like, in the Schwar, there's, there's really important sharing norms, but um, once people start to get an income that they're making themselves, they don't view that as being as shareable. Um, and I was thinking about this this idea from the, the risk reduction um, hunting strategy idea from behavioral ecology, where I mean, 
at least some of the logic of that was that um, your hunting returns would be based on effort, but right, even the best hunters and even the people who spend the most time, there's going to be variance, mm -hmm. and um, that would then favor a sharing strategy, right, amongst mm -hmm. hunters. Whereas for things like in horticultural societies where you could garden, mm -hmm. and really your caloric return would just be a matter of how many hours you spent in the garden, you wouldn't necessarily expect a sharing norm there because people could just go get the food. Right? Or it's on a seasonal level as opposed to right. a, a daily level. If you had a whole, you know, a drought year or something. So I was wondering if maybe because where, where you work, I mean, there's money, but the money comes from a non-effort based, um, right? It's not effort based. I mean, they get the money no matter what they do. Um, if maybe that would mean that sharing would be more likely for that money. You would have a psychology with that money that, right, it's like a windfall, you should spread it around, whereas maybe effort based. Is that, do you think that's I totally true? think that's true. And it's one of the, I mean, I was talking to Carthage the other day about these windfall effects. And, games and I think it's really similar to that. I just yeah. don't think that people act the same when the money is handed to them. And they call it sit down money. I mean that's you know it's it's widely known as being like money that you don't have to do anything for and you just get it. People get upset <laughs> if they don't, you know, if they didn't get it for some reason. And so it's it's right. not um, I I really think that that probably is is part of it because yeah for exactly the reasons you're talking about. So this actually, I, I was thinking along these lines, keeping in mind that we're all sitting down. Um, uh, that it, it's important to distinguish the functional consequences of an activity from the representations that uh, shape people's motives when they engage in the activity. So you said at a number of points that you, you were viewing gambling as distribution um, akin to that, say, that um, takes place in terms of managing production risk and foraging. I think functionally it may have that consequence, but I'd be really surprised if representationally um, it was thought of in those terms. And you know, it's very easy to over extrapolate from one's own field experience. <coughs> but um, uh, my guess is that uh, if these folks are anything like the people that I work with, that um, they actually, the attraction in the gambling is precisely because of the windfall and not because of the sharing. So, I mean, one thing about hunting, especially if you're if your sort of traditional set of motivations doesn't involve camels, guns, and pickle trucks, right? Um, that is, that at relatively low effort, with fairly high certainty, you can get a huge um, return. Uh, there, then when there's this substantial variation in a large role of chance in there, then windfalls really matter a lot, right? So they become culturally marked and valued in a way that then sets the stage for gambling once money comes in. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, the gambling thing is weird, because I think you're right that people definitely are, are going into the game wanting to win, and they do. Like, you'll see one person will win $1,000, and a bunch of other people will lose. But the, and so you're right about that distinction between function and motivation. But, I mean, functionally, the way it plays out is then, first, there's not very much to, to spend your money on. Because right? there's like nothing in the shop, and there's no place else to spend your money. And when you're up in um, Bijudanga, this other community that's on the coast, it's closer to Broome, people will win a thousand dollars and they'll take off as soon as they can to town and they'll buy iPods and TVs and whatever um, things that are you know non divisible goods. Um, but in the community, what ha tends to happen is people win a lot of money, it might affect their grocery bill the next day, but of course, th that doesn't affect how much they're actually going to consume of that food because people will come know who won and will know to come to that house. And also the person will go back and play the next day and, you know, it's unlikely that they'll win three or four days in a row. So I think there is really a distinction between the motivation and the function. I'm not sure which is, you know, I guess I'm focusing here more on the function. So related to that, why, why do only the old guys have guns? If people can win a thousand dollars, if there's not a lot to spend it on right now, but guns are actually very useful, then it's it's part um, that you need you need a license and things like that yeah. to be able to get one, and so um, and I'm not sure if maybe you need a driver's license. I don't know something to get one, and so. Part of it is like a responsibility issue, but part of it is that it's it seems to be regulated within the men's world that it like it's not okay for for these young men to just go and get a gun without having the permission of their elders, and the elders don't want them to have guns because they're dangerous and the suicide rate is really high in these communities and things like that. So I think that they 
feel a sense of responsibility about keeping the number of guns in the community limited, even though they obviously have an important function in terms of subsistence. Okay. Uh, what, 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 are they, what do they gamble over? I mean, what do they play? What kind of game do they play? Yeah. It's something called 2 3. It's like a really fast paced, like counting card game. Um, so I'm just wondering, I mean, if you're trying to argue that gambling is functional as a form of redistribution, there ought to be some. You ought to maximize gambling games that um, take skill out of it. You shouldn't it play it is. It's all, it's you all luck. Play dice, not poker. Yeah, it, it's, it's a luck game. Okay. It's just numbers. Yeah, no skill at all. It's not like poker. Yeah. Sarah? Um, I was wondering if you um, actually look at. Um, the size of the hunting party being larger for the camel hunts and the fact that it's distributed more widely, whether the individual return rate is actually higher. Because you didn't show that data at the right, at the individual level. level. Yeah, um, I didn't do that. Um, again, my guess is that it's not going to matter very much because the hunting party size wasn't that different. Um, but if there are norms about sharing it more extensively or something, would it? enough to balance out, which could be another explanation for why people go out, go out and travel and Yeah, I don't think that, I don't, I, I don't, I've heard people talk about any kind of specific norm about you have to share a camel more widely. It's more like, it's sort of a common sense argument, like it's sort of almost like, you know, tolerated that kind of thing. Like, you've got all more, even, you don't even have enough meat to be able to keep this in your freezer. So, like, there's just no sense in, and people don't like it that much, right? So they, I think that they, um, I don't think people feel pressured to share it um, as much as they just, you know, I mean, but I do think there's probably sort of a show-off kind of thing that is um, linked to how people share it. And I think it would be interesting to see who they're sharing it to and whether the camel sharing differs um, than, you know, from these other kinds of sharing, like kangaroo sharing. When you, when you have the elder people going out and getting the food, who do they share it with versus the younger people and who do they share with? Because I think there's a difference there, but I haven't heard people sort of talk about the pressures of having to share this camel meat because mm -hmm. it's just, it's just so and much similarly, different. but you just said that if there's a constraint on how much camel meat you can store, mm -hmm. that could be another reason why the actual returns from camel might be lower than you'd expect from just looking at the total returns that camel or camel produces. So you would only count. It. So you have to cut it off at you know at whatever one individual household yeah. could, could keep can store stores. Well, I don't know whether I would do that because everything is, sh I mean, I'm not sure. It may it not be what's going on, but it would be an alternate explanation for it. Um, I mean, I think it would be interesting to look at the individual, I mean, I think looking at the individual return rates for the different types of meat would be interesting, but um, I still think Campbell's going to be off the charts. I mean, it, it's, it was like 121,000 plus calories for camel, and the next thing is like, I don't know, 6,000 or something like that. So it's just like a whole order of magnitude higher. So it might come down a little bit if you adjust it for things like that, but probably not enough to, to make it not seem like it's the optimal choice. Also, at, at least as I understand it, in the way that optimal foraging theory is usually applied, it's just return for investment, not um, how much of that return you then actually keep. So it could be that you don't keep any of um, what you you get for some specific foods because you're the wrong age or the wrong gender or whatever it is to actually consume that. Um, but presumably, it all pays off in the end, and that's why people do it. I mean, that's the assumption of optimal fortune here. So even if you're with a camel, you got much more food than you could keep in your freezer, you would still want to count all of the, the calories that were obtained because there's some benefit somewhere to giving it away. That's that, it's an assumption in the theory. I mean, that it may be incorrect, but I think it's just absent. I think it's just assumed. It's implicit. Yeah. I think, it, but I don't think people ever mm -hmm. it's not it's not a thought that people have that they have to have that much food to keep Right, but what benefit means, whether that's calories that you consume or calories that you give away, is left implicit. It's never, it's not Absolutely. part of the population. Camels were introduced around the turn of the century, but they didn't have 
rifles and pickups until recently. Was it that camels were never hunted uh, in the past or have always been hunted? Uh, and now they're just modified it by using pickups and rifles, or is it the camels only started being hunted relatively recently when they had pickups and rifles? Um, I asked people about that, like whether they would go out with a spear and go get a camel, and they said, you know, maybe, like it would be an extremely rare instance, because it, it takes a lot more coordination and things like that to be able to do. So it wasn't, it was not a common food source pre-vehicles and rifles. And in fact, I mean, I think that's, and that's partly why I think it doesn't have the social value that these other hunt types have, because it is, it, it is so new. Um, so. And people, I mean, where do you talk about, again, with the keeper thing, they, um, they said that they did, there weren't keeper around where they uh, were living, a lot of these last bush groups that came in, so they didn't actually, those last groups didn't start hunting keeper until much later, but I think they were sort of generally in the area, and so they were, they had norms about them, even if they didn't get them that, as commonly as they do now. And obviously, they're, and it's something that is a lot easier to get. With. It's not like an emu, which is you know a land, which they don't get emu right in this area either, but they do sort of neighboring areas, and that's obviously because it's a land bird, it's a little easier. But these busters, they'll they'll take off and fly, so I imagine that the the return rate gets significantly better when you've got a, a rifle. Um, Jeff, I have a I was just interested in learning a little bit more about uh, the burning of land practices, the extent to which they are sort of regulated at a communal level, or it's just, you know, independent groups going off doing this thing. I wonder who's benefiting the most, the guys that are doing the burning, or the whole community. I mean, I have no idea how it works, I'm just interested in learning a little bit more about it. Well, I can direct you to some good papers to read on it, but it's sort of all kind of being figured out. Um, what, so when people talk about burning, you're, so you have access to certain tracts of land that are, and, and your access to this, some of them are inherited through birthright and some of them through ritual knowledge. So if you get high enough up into the um, ritual hierarchy, you can start to have sort of visitor kind of access to different areas. But everybody has sort of um, an area of land that, you know, that they would say, this is my area. And you're allowed to burn that land. And so the strict kind of rule would be that you can't burn in anybody else's land without permission. And we're starting to try to, um, we talked about trying to get some satellite images and maps and try to talk to people to get a little bit more detail about what that means exactly. Um, because, and I, th I think Rebecca has been trying to get that data when she goes out hunting with people, like if they burn, trying to figure out whose land it is. Um, but as far as the benefits of it to people, um, I think, I think it's a really complicated question. So what, what they started doing first was what they actually found was that there were these benefits for small game. So it tended to be first thought of as being something that was maybe more important for men. And, um, but if, so you burn and it creates this kind of mosaic habitat. And, but when you immediately go out and burn, it clears the land so that you can see these guana burrows. So you have you know, very short term benefits, um, mainly for women who are guana. Um, and now they're trying to look and see if there are benefits also to um, for a large game game because if you create these habitat mosaics and then that would actually then impact women's hunting for animals and things like that. So my guess is that it probably has benefits on all of those levels, and that's what they're sort of done. Rebecca Bird are looking at um, to try to sort of figure out the nuances of it, but um, there isn't. Okay, thank you very much.